You had, on the one hand, what we call quantitative restrictions, that you had a permission from the government ministry of commerce to do any import that you wanted. And second, you had uh, the, the high tariff structure, which I already talked about. And so what has happened is that, uh, again, over the past, that it took about 10 years to remove the quantitative restrictions. So now you can just about import anything you feel like, uh, which was done by around 2002, 2003. Uh, and I've already talked about the, the reduction in the tariff rates. Now, those are in some sense all macro reforms that I've just talked about until now. Now let me go to in some what you call microeconomic reforms. And actually, industrial deregulation was the big thing that was done in 1991, in July, uh, July 24, 1991. Um, there was a big announcement done on July 24. Um, then we've done a whole uh, host of infrastructure reforms I'll come to, of financial sector strengthening, uh, capital market deepening, and somewhat less in agriculture. Uh, talking about industrial deregulation, I've already talked about it in the beginning. We've eliminated capacity licensing. That is what I said earlier, that you had to get a license from the industry ministry to set up a plant. And the license actually said you can, that you, I'm giving you a license to manufacture cars and up to only, say, 10,000 a year or 20,000 a year. And so actually it was, in fact, a crime to produce more than the license. Uh, it's a very strange thing to... You can't even believe it now, actually, that you could be a criminal by producing more. Um, so it was, it was a big deal removing this capacity licensing. Um, so, for example, among the controversies that the Ambani's have faced is that they actually used to produce more than what they were licensed. And so they were bad, bo bad boys because they were uh, uh, disobeying the, and the, it was sort of underhand, and there were all kinds of things that it, this is how they're doing underhand. And of course, if you produce more than you license, that means you're also doing something to somehow get more imports to be able to produce more. So it had lots of implications in terms of the controls that, it, that were exercised. I've talked about the removal uh, of the MRTP Act, restrictions on large companies, the termination of phase manufacturing programs, and now you don't tell anyone how much you should import first year, second year, fifth year production, and so on, which we used to do. Um, to get any foreign technology uh, agreement, that is foreign uh, import of foreign technology through foreign collaboration agreement, again, you had to come to the Ministry of Industry to get that license, to get that agreement, to get the foreign collaboration. That again was also removed. All this incidentally was done in one shot in July 24, 1991. Um, there's been a major revision of patent regime, which has taken much longer, uh, freeing of foreign direct investment. Again, every foreign direct investment had to be approved by the government. There were long lists of sectors in which you could not have foreign direct investments. There was almost, ne almost negligible foreign direct investment till the early 1990s, and that has all been freed. Uh, there was, again, a one-shot big liberalization, 1991, July 2024. 20, and then, uh, over time, there's been liberalized further. Um, and finally, a program of small-scale industry de-reservation. Now, that probably sounds... Oh, I've, I've got a spelling mistake here, uh, um, which I better correct uh, next time. Um, that you now somehow you, you, you probably wouldn't even, you think, what is this Greek uh, small scale industry de reservation? Um, there was a list of uh, 831 items uh, which were reserved for small scale industries. That is, a uh, large industry was not allowed to produce these items, 831 of them. Um, it included almost all labor-intensive industries. And the <coughs> rationale was that small, that what you want is employment in the country. Small-scale small scale industries are more employment-intensive, so you don't want a large industry to get into this area. So example, clothing, shoes, toys, hand tools, uh, all kinds of dyes. Um, I can't repeat 831 of them to you, but, um, and all kinds of very detailed classifications. There were 15 items of clothing, for example, or more. So all these were reserved for small scale industries. And this is a major, this in my view, has been a major problem, which actually we still haven't got out of, um, that the competitiveness of East Asian countries came in all these areas. Um, 
what I just mentioned, uh, clothing, toys, shoes, hand tools, and so on. All the stationery that you use, for example, toilet rolls, uh, among other things. Um, if I stand here long enough, I'll probably remember 831 of them. But um, so, um, it, you know, to my mind, a major issue that um, take clothing, for example. If you go to uh, any department store uh, anywhere in the world, you are beginning now to find uh, Indian clothing, but very still very little because um, the structure of the to, to, to let me give you an understanding of how this how these things make a difference. That the structure of the market is that you have large department stores. They buy say shirts, men's shirts in bulk, with quality control. They're not going to deal with a thousand small firms selling them 1,000 shirts each. Uh, and the major problem, quality control, branding, and so on. So we basically counted ourselves out of that market. Meanwhile, China took off um, in all of these uh, items. Uh, so in fact, if you look at the Indian clothing export composition, it is highly concentrated in middle-level women's clothing. Because women's clothing is more variegated. So in fact, this was an advantage that you have small firms responding to uh, doing small lots of women's Western clothing. And you almost you read very little of men's clothing being exported. Um, now, this reform, um, some of us argued for for a very long period of time. And this was not done until about uh, 2003, 4, thereabouts. And there's still something to serve. I don't remember now how many, but not too many now. But the problem, in some sense, that has taken place is that because this was reserved for such a long time, um, you still don't see much entry of large firms into all these items. So one of the things that is happening today, for example, is that uh, China, of course, is the biggest uh, exporter um, of uh, items in, this, in all of these, in, in these areas. Um, and they are uh, now. Uh, Chinese have got pretty strong wage pressures upwards. So slowly, the expectation would be that next 10, 15 years, a lot of this stuff will move out of China. <clears throat> and what is happening is that whatever movement is taking place today from whatever information one sees uh, sort of sketchily is going to Vietnam, Philippines, Bangladesh, and so on, not coming here. Because we just have not got used to producing this stuff. There is another aspect of this, of course, just do with labor relations uh, issues, that uh, there are problems to do with uh, labor legislation in terms of difficulty in hiring large peoples of numbers and um, uh, not having problems. Um, infrastructure, traditionally, infrastructure everywhere in the world has been dominated by the public sector. That means power, roads, telecom, railways, and so on. Um, that until the late 1980s, uh, almost everywhere in the world, this was dominated by the public sector. Of course, differences between different sectors. Uh, and same thing, of course, here. So through the 90s uh, and, well, last 15 years or so, actually, mid-90s till now, a lot has been done in terms of infrastructure policy reform. In the power sector, we have a new Electricity Act of 2003, um, which uh, allows uh, uh, the private sector to, put, to generate electricity, distribute electricity, and even transmit electricity if they want to, uh, of course, under some conditions. Um, we have uh, set up now uh, uh, the, uh, electricity regulators in the central government as well as state governments, the central CERC, the, the Central Electricity Regulatory Council, Commission, Commission, and State Electricity Regulatory Commissions. Um, um, the idea basically is, uh, in, in this is that you want to have more competition electricity production. Um, you want private sector resources to come into electricity. Um, but at the same time, uh, you do need some tariff regulation uh, because um, you will always have some monopoly element that you can't have 14 wires coming to your house. You only have one wire coming to your house. Uh, there are provisions, electricity acts for open access. That is, in principle, you can have you can have 15 generators, say one transmitter, and distributor coming to your house. In principle, you, 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 you there are technical ways of my choosing. I want to get electricity from 
generator X rather than generator Y. So in fact, the act provides for that free access. That hasn't really happened yet very much. But there is a whole lot of reforms have been done. But a lot of problems remain because state governments don't really let the state electricity regulators uh, operate very independently. And so tariffs are still um, have a lot of problems in different states. Some states uh, say the electricity should be given free to agriculture. Some states uh, say it at, it's at, at very highly subsidized levels and so on. So a lot of reform has been done, but still a long way to go. Um, in case of roads, um, the, once again, uh, roads used to be only uh, invested in by the public sector, by the government. Now, through the public-private participation process, you bid out uh, the national highways for the private sector to invest. There is a, a program for viability gap funding, which is the government says that, look, uh, I want a road to be built from here to Jaipur. Um, then you ask them to bid how much you are willing to, that we're willing to give some subsidy for it. And the, the bidder who asks for the least subsidy gets the contract. Um, so that's a pretty successful program going on. And since 2002, National Highways Development uh, Project, which is doing all the four laning of highways across the country. We already have the Golden Quadrilateral, uh, Delhi, Mumbai, uh, Chennai, Kolkata, Delhi. They've been completed, uh, four lane highways. There's a north, south, east, west, and other uh, spurs. So that program is going on. Another huge program that was initiated in 2000 with the Prime Minister Gram Sadak Yojana, that is to connect all villages uh, with uh, all weather uh, roads. Uh, telecom, again, we used to have, I would have told you the telecom story right in the beginning. So we had a monopoly of uh, uh, the government uh, companies, BSNL. Uh, actually, we, it didn't used to be a company, it was just a department of telecommunications which provided uh, telephone services. Uh, the first thing that was done was to found the MTNL, which still uh, gives the telephones in Delhi, uh, Mahanagar Telephone Nagar, uh, Mahanagar Telephone Nigam Limited. Then why is it Mahanagar? It's a Hindi and English combined, right? Mahanagar Telephone Nigam and then Limited. Um, so MTNL. So that was the first thing, corporatization that was done. Then the national one of BSNL, Bharat Sanchar Nigam Limited. Um, and then, of course, there was huge new entry of the private sector and cell phones. So you now come to a situation where you have more than 800 million cell phones uh, in the country, probably nearing 900 million now. Huge deregulation. Here again, uh, Formation Telecom Regulatory Authority of India, um, which uh, governs the entry and the conditions for entry. As you'll see in newspapers, a lot of discussion going on in this, but let me leave it at that. This has been basically a, a more successful uh, infrastructure program. Same thing in ports, that all the ports were government owned. We have two kinds of ports. Central government ports are called major port trusts. Um, and um, um, we used to call the minor ports, which are governed by the states. Now we call them non-major ports because many of the, they're no longer minor. So we don't call the minor, which is a non-major. The difference is that the major port trusts are governed by the central government and the other ports are governed by the state governments. And basically what we've done is to now allow private entry into all the ports uh, in terms of investment, running of berths and so on. And that we have formed the tariff authority of uh, major ports to govern the tariffs in the ports. Um, airports and uh, civil aviation, um, again, uh, we used to have only Indian, Indian Airlines to do domestic uh, services and Air India for international services. And now, of course, uh, new private airlines have come in in both domestic and international. Uh, there's still lots of problems going on right now, but there's been a huge difference. It used to be, I remember when I uh, was here in 1971 um, for a year, uh, um, there used to be only, I think, two flights a day to Mumbai. Am I right? You know, these are, uh, one in the morning, one in IC 264 to Kolkata, and uh, <laughs> IC 839 to uh, Hyderabad. One, you know, all those numbers are etched in one's uh, mind. Um, so they used, it, it, was, you know, it was impossible, again, it was impossible to get a ticket. You had to ring up someone to get a ticket. Um, so now, you know, you can just choose your time whenever you want to go, you get a flight. Um, so it's really a huge, absolute sea change that has uh, taken place. 
We also used to limit international uh, airlines on how many flights they could have. So, for example, now I think you have something like um, uh, maybe 10 or 15 flights a day to Singapore from different places, maybe more than that now, actually. Uh, because if flights to Singapore now, for example, from all the four major cities, five, five, six, Delhi, Mumbai, uh, Kolkata, Chennai, Bangalore, Hyderabad, and from other places. Uh, so this is sort of beginning of open skies. Uh, and um, new private airports. Uh, so that you have now already Delhi, Mumbai, uh, Delhi, Mumbai Bangalore, Hyderabad, Cochin. Um, so there's been absolute change in, in this area as well. So uh, coming financial sector, two things. Um, one, you want to increase competition, again, to have more efficiency in the banking system. And two, also strengthen regulation. As you improve competition, you also need to do better regulation. So we did two things in the competition. Um, one, that uh, in the pub we have, um, I think, 18 public sector banks plus the state bank when they're plus a subsidiary. So I think it's about 25 or 28 public sector banks. So the one reform that was done over the years was that now there's private investment in every public sector bank. So there's some private ownership in public sector banks. Um, and greater autonomy. And you might have seen, what is interesting is that the Ministry of Finance um, is the owner and acts as the owner of public sector, the owner of public sector share at public sector banks, the government share of public sector banks. You will have seen um, some statements by the Governor Reserve Bank in uh, last, last week asking the government to desist from giving directions to public sector banks. So this is part of this whole this, this sort of debate, this kind of discussion goes on, that uh, it is the case that um, from a situation earlier where a government had 100% ownership, so it, it was giving directions all the time to public sector banks what to do. As we disinvested part of the shares of public sector banks, and also there was an understanding that the government should not interfere, so there had been much less interference by the government in public sector banks. It seems to have increased in the couple, last couple of years. Um, and, um, but nonetheless, relative to the situation before, one reform was to make public sector banks operate much more independently than they could before. And because now you have disinvestment, that is, you have private sector ownership, private sector shares in, in the banks, that um, the, 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 they are listed in the stock exchange, so they're much more uh, accountable to the shareholders as well, and the accounts are much more uh, transparent. Second, uh, we've had new entry of private sector banks, uh, about 10 of them, ICICI Bank, HDFC Bank, Kotak Mahindra, Access Bank, Indusind, and so on. So uh, starting from uh, mid-1990s to now, the share of private sector banks has gone up from zero to around 20%, 20 to 23%. So now actually they're providing real competition because ICICI Bank now is the second largest bank after the state bank. And HDFC Bank is I think number five or six, something like that. So the private sector banks are now actually providing competition. And so the public, and because of this competition, public sector banks have, have had to function much better. Um, and we also now allow foreign ownership. Uh, in fact, um, uh, HDFC Bank and ICICI Bank, for example, are 70 to 74% owned uh, by foreign investors. Um, so there's been a huge change here as well. So basically, to summarize, um, the, the, the disinvestment, uh, listing, autonomy of public sector banks, plus entry private sector banks, has introduced much more competition in banking. And then uh, we have, uh, from the Reserve Bank, uh, upgraded the prudential regulation to basically international, uh, international quality, and perhaps better than international quality, as proven by the fact that we did not have a crisis when the North Atlantic did. Um, then um, there's been a lot of technology improvement in the bank so that you have a lot of net banking now, uh, a lot of technology in the operation of banks, plus how the customers deal with banks and so on. You, you had to invest in a sort of dedicated communication backbone which connects all the banks together that the Reserve Bank had to do and so on. Um, same thing in insurance that, again, there used to be only public sector insurance companies, one life insurance corporation of India for life insurance three or is it four uh, general uh, insurance companies. 
um, and now there's been private uh, insurance entry. The only issue there is that we've limited uh, FDI insurance companies to 26%, and there's this ongoing debate in Parliament on whether we can increase that to 49%. Uh, capital market deepening, um, as I said earlier, um, the, there was a controller of capital issues uh, in, the, um, uh, in the finance ministry. Uh, he was abolished in 1991. Uh, Securities and Exchange Board of India was established, so that they are the overall regulator of the capital market. Um, and we removed the pricing and issues <coughs> control, and the new exchange came, National Stock Exchange, and more recently, now another new exchange is coming up. And so there's been a huge development in the capital market as well. Um, the, uh, one, uh, the, the one other thing that's happened in the capital market is uh, the allowing of portfolio investment in the stock market, which has sort of uh, provided much more competition within the stock market itself because of more resources coming from abroad and the f institutional investors demanding much more transparency from all the companies that list in the market. Uh, agricultural reforms, um, not as much as we should have had. Um, so in fact, I'll obit, well, uh, basically one thing that did happen in the 90s was that because uh, industrial sector was highly protected with very high levels of uh, customs duties, uh, 100, 110 percent, etc. Um, that uh, therefore resources. Th there was a terms, sort of terms of trade, were in favor of industry. So as we brought down the industrial tariffs and made um, and removed quantitative restrictions in industry, um, the imbalance in the agriculture industry improved. So the agriculture sort of uh, uh, benefited from that by the industrial tariffs coming down. So kind of indirect, but it benefited agriculture. The, uh, we had, again, uh, huge uh, quantitative restrictions on agriculture. Some of them continue, but many of them replaced by tariffs that are still high. Um, the, there's been introduction of forward trading in some important commercial crops. Um, they used to have lots of restrictions, in interstate movements of, of food grains. Uh, some of them are still there, but lots of them are removed. Um, this is a continuing uh, debate on how much needs to be done in agriculture. So um, where do we go now? First, we need to recognize how industrial growth has really improved over the last 20 years compared to before. What are the emerging issues? We really need the, the uh, one issue uh, that is uh, dominating discussion today is that we had achieved between eight and a half and nine percent growth between 2003 and 2008. We now come down to six, seven percent. And so the debate at present is, was that a sort of, um, uh, was that a bubble? Is that something we can continue? Or do we need to bring down our expectations of long-term growth from eight, nine percent to seven percent or something? That's the current debate. But this emerging issue is, the way I would put it is, what do we make sure, how do we make sure that we can have sustained continuous growth of 8-9% a year for the next, at least next 20 years? And to give an idea of what that means is that if you have 8-8.5% um, eight, eight GDP growth regularly and you have 1.1% to 1.4% population growth over the next 20 years, to get 7% per capita growth, you'll need 8.5% GDP growth, something of that order. Seven, why 7%? 7 because 7% annual growth means doubling in 10 years. And so this is a sobering thought that even if you grow like mad by our standards, like 8.5%, 9%, you will still, per capita income,